Welcome back to Jacques in the Garden. Today we're going to do a garden tour and it's now mid-December. So things haven't grown too much, but there are some changes. I want to give you guys some updates on some of the previous videos as well. First, we'll start over here in this big patch. This is where I had all my tomatoes in the previous season. And I won't ever have tomatoes here again, at least not in the next year, because when I pulled all those tomatoes out, I found root knot nematode. So that's a huge no-no. You don't want to plant back into that. You're just going to have more tomato problems. So this is the first step of the rotation, which is growing brassicas. I haven't quite decided what I'm going to grow next, but everything's looking quite healthy for the most part. I have, I believe, some Brussels sprouts back here. As you know, it's very easy to lose your tags, but up front here I have these tiara cabbages that tend to be smaller and grow faster, so I'm really excited for that. And then over here is just a field of broccoli, basically. In the middle I have some broccolini, and everything looks really wonderful. You'll notice that some of them have a little bit of leaf damage, but overall things are looking quite healthy, and the only thing I've really done is use a little bit of BT. BT is one of those things that is a targeted pesticide. So if you put BT on your plants, it will only really affect things like cabbage loopers, caterpillars. So I feel like there's a low chance of getting any sort of beneficials damaged. And that's why they overall look so good. Now, right in front of me is my root stout potato bed. So this was planted out in the, my three ways to plant potatoes in the garden video that I just recently put out. And I haven't seen anything poke up yet, but we just had a really good rain. So I'm feeling really optimistic because this is really well watered now and the straw is starting to really consolidate into a sort of soil-like substance. Now I have considered actually burying this in compost and then layering straw on top, but I haven't fully decided yet. I think I'll wait for the first sprouts to emerge. Now off to the right is kind of the wild zone of the garden. This is an area that early in the spring I actually had cleaned out entirely, ripped all these different weeds out. You can see there's still quite a bit of English ivy, which is the main thing I'm really worried about. But I'm really excited because I have this new bed here. It is a six in one, we'll call it an L-shaped birdies bed. Um, it's currently in its L-shaped format. And as you can see, it has basically actually straight corners instead of the rounded corners. And the really nice thing about it is this little corner element here, because what that means is that if I could get into my garden just from right here, I could access every single part of my bed without having to go around it, behind it. So I'm actually thinking of putting it up right against the wall like you see here. And this is actually something that we just put up on the store for pre-order and they're going to be all in mist green. So the test batch that I got was beige, but they're all gonna be mist green and I'm really excited for it because it really unlocks parts of your garden that otherwise will be wasted by putting a bigger bed and having to put walkways around it. So that's how I'm gonna use this guy and we'll definitely be planting out this entire row here with more raised beds because I'm ready to switch over to raised beds instead of just in ground. I've had a lot of good success with the few raised beds that I have already, so I want to keep expanding that in my garden. Now over here, you'll see a couple different things. First and foremost is this pollinator patch. And what you see are a bunch of straw flowers. They are actually still blooming, even though we are in December. And all I've been doing is essentially mowing down the tops of this and letting it regrow constantly. And this one stand of straw flowers has been here all the way back since February. I haven't even planted it, it was entirely self-sown. And I still see bees humming and buzzing all around it throughout the year. So I'm really excited for that. And in general, this whole pollinator patch looks wild, but that's exactly what I want. I wanted to create a refuge for all those beneficial bugs that they could just basically live here without any fear of me interacting with it. I'm not going to mow this down. I'm not going to cut it. I'm not going to harvest anything. They could just hibernate here, do whatever they need to do and go around and pollinate my garden as well as eating some of those nasty bugs like aphids. So highly recommend you guys sort of mix in these wild patches inside your garden instead of just on the edges, because it really provides a nice refuge for those bugs that you actually want to keep in your garden. Now, right behind that are my tomatoes, which I think I'm honestly ready to walk away from. They just don't get enough sun over here in this section. And you can see they have a little bit of disease issue. So I think I'm just gonna go ahead and rip these out pretty soon, because I'm not really getting anything out of them. If I'm not getting anything out of a plant, I'm starting to feel more and more inclined to just remove it. And this is a case right here where I don't think it's worth it. Over here is my squash tunnel trellis build that I did earlier in the season. And right now you can see it is bare. And that's because I planted a bunch of sweet peas along the base, but probably some crow came by and pricked out every single one. So I'm a little bit bummed about that. But on the back, my orange clock vine is starting to colonize it and it's looking really nicely. I'll probably end up going to the nursery and picking up some sweet pea transplants because I really want that wall covered in sweet peas because that delicious aroma is so nice when you walk right by it. Now up in front center here is my garlic bed. This is the first garlic bed I did. 
for the season and it's in my garlic video. So this is a mixture of soft necks and hard necks. I believe it's actually mostly hard necks and it's growing along quite nicely. If you're in a colder climate and you're surprised to see this much garlic growth, this is how it really is in San Diego. There's not really a hard frost or freeze or snow. So I could really let these grow fully earlier in the season without any fear of them getting damaged by frost or anything like that. So this is looking quite nice. Overall, I'd say 98% of it actually came in. So I'm quite pleased with that. And I think we're gonna have a stellar harvest this year. Now back here in this section is actually my main brassica or my earliest brassica zone. And it's looking really, really wonderful with the exception of that cabbage right there, which is really <laughs> quite tiny. Everything else is growing quite nicely. The cabbages are starting to head. And up front right here, these plants with the really big leaves are actually cauliflower. I have peaked and currently I don't really see any heads, but the leaves are starting to twist all around the very base of it, which means that the head is actually starting to form. Now over here, oh man, see this is a future project is the dogs are jumping in the garden, pooping in it. So future vid will be building a better fence for the garden. But let's move on from that. What you'll see intermixed between here is actually some elephant garlic. So this right here is the elephant garlic. If you didn't know, elephant garlic isn't really like a true garlic. It's actually more of like a leek with a very large bulb. And so these are gonna look pretty, they're looking pretty good already. And I'm hoping to get a pretty decent harvest here. This is an entirely no-till bed, so it's very compost rich, which should give them all the organic matter they need. But the real pride and joy here are these Brussels sprouts. So right now, like I mentioned, we are in December and the Brussels sprouts look absolutely wonderful. They're fully growing in, have plenty of leaves, and they're even starting to form little sproutlets this is very early on in the year for that to be happening for me. Previously, I waited too long, and what happened was that as I got into spring, they basically got covered in aphids or they opened up because it got too hot. So I think this year, nailed the timing. It's gonna be a wonderful, wonderful Brussels sprout harvest. But you might hear those chickens, so let's go pop over and say hi to them. So the chickens are gathering because they know that when they see me, they're gonna definitely get a treat. So let's give them some grubs here. This is a great way to supplement some protein, especially in the winter time where the egg production really slows down. This kind of gives them an extra little food source and they absolutely love it. But just a couple updates over here. The orchard is looking overall pretty healthy. The fig has gone fully dormant now, so it's dropped all its leaves. You could see that <laughs> my attempt to affix this burlap bag did not actually work out in the end. I think this one is just a little bit too beat down. So I'll end up getting some new burlap and redoing this, but I haven't actually dug it up too much, so I'm really pleased with that. And the lemon over here has fully now started to leaf out, and I think I just left those lemons on for too long, but overall, things are looking healthy, chickens are happy. At this time of year, just so you're aware, as you get into the colder season, you get less light, the chickens will produce less eggs. And so right now, with seven chickens, we're only getting about two to three eggs a day, which is fine, it's just a natural cycle. But yeah, they're very healthy, very happy. We don't really have any more of those issues that I had previously. Let's go take a peek at the garlic bed up front. Over here in the front yard is the bed that I revived using just a potato fork. And as I mentioned in the video, I planted a bunch of different garlics. These are actually almost entirely soft nut garlic. And I'm really pleased to see that just about every single one has fully emerged now. And as I mentioned in that video, this was done in a much more loose style than I'm used to. I didn't soak anything. I didn't really prep the ground that much. I basically just dug a furrow and dropped some cloves in. Didn't even bury them as deeply as I traditionally do. So I'm really excited to see how this does. If it does really well, maybe I was wasting all my time previously doing all those complicated steps, but I'll definitely let you guys know in late spring and summer when I actually harvest this out. The other thing I'll quickly mention is that on the periphery here, I have three artichokes. And these artichokes survived all summer long with zero watering. I basically shut off irrigation here entirely because I wanted to save water. But as perennial plants do, they're extremely hardy and they've all now grown back and I'll probably get a wonderful spring harvest of artichokes. So let's go check out the container garden really quick and then we'll move over to the main garden in the south. Over in this part of my yard, I actually have built a fully fledged container garden. And the main centerpiece here are these green stalks. So in this green stock, I have entirely loaded with Napa cabbages. The main goal of doing it in the green stock this year was that I didn't want it to be entirely full of earwigs. Every time I've put it in ground, all those ruffled little leaves are like basically the perfect little habitat for earwigs. So I'm hoping that keeping it up in the air will help reduce that problem and I'll actually be able to get some Napa cabbage that I can enjoy. On the top here, this is broccoli, not broccolini. And it's looking really quite healthy. I have an overwintered pepper next to it. 
and I'm actually really excited to see if I could get a really successful broccoli harvest out of this, then that's wonderful because that means I could have six broccoli plants growing in one level all at the same time. So that's going to be quite the harvest if it works well. And judging by the growth right now, it's going quite well. So let's pop over to this section where I have more of my traditional containers such as bags. And actually I have basically a little tree nursery here. These are the trees that my wandering eye has picked up and without any sort of contemplation about where I'm going to put them. As you can see, I don't really have that much space for trees, but I have found some pretty good success growing trees in containers. So maybe in the springtime we'll do a full video on how to grow your trees in containers. But last thing I'll mention is I have another green stock here, which is all broccolini on top. So that's a comparison of broccoli versus broccolini. And I also have a bunch of soft nut garlic that I'm growing as green garlic. So I'm really excited to see how that goes. But up front and center here are my grow bags from my how to plant potatoes three different ways. And no, nothing has really emerged yet, which isn't surprising. And it's only been really a couple weeks. But other than that, I have another example of essentially every single type of brassica plant that I have growing in the garden. I also have a counterpart in a container. So I have the snap of cabbage here, some broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and cauliflower. Everything's looking really quite wonderful. So I'm quite pleased to see that brassicas grow really, really well in containers. If you're space limited, definitely give it a shot. Just grab a green bag and throw a broccoli in there and honestly, it looks really great and requires very little work. So with that said, let's go check out the South Garden. Over here in the South Garden, there's no shortage of brassicas. So let's talk about these right here in the front bed. And I actually did a little bit of experiment here where I have broccolini growing all along this row. And now up front and center here, is a broccolini that I did not top whatsoever. When I say top, I mean that when I transplanted it and it was only about six inches tall, I literally cut the top off. So this one I left uncut and you can see it's produced one florette. Now back here, these, this one and this one both, I actually topped. So I removed that top little bit of growth. You can see I have double the growth. So nothing lost, but everything gained. So all you have to do is cut it at the base and you'll get two side shoots instead. You can see right here, and now I have double the broccolini from the same plant that is right over there, just basically wasting away, growing me one florette. So I highly recommend that when you grow broccolini specifically, that you do top it because you'll get way more out of it. But for things like broccoli, which I actually have growing in this bed over here, you want to actually just leave it whole and let it grow its proper crown. So this right here is actually one that's ready to harvest, essentially. You can see I've left it totally uncut. And what the broccoli plant will do compared to the broccolini is that it will force this one nice big head or a broccoli crown. And then once you actually snip this, it'll start producing a bunch of little side florets similar to broccolini. But you don't want to actually cut this one early because you'll just end up with two tiny broccoli heads. They're really actually bred genetically to produce this one large crown. Right next to it is a wall of the shelling peas. They've grown substantially since the last time you've seen it. And actually also the giant jacaranda tree that's in my yard over there has been removed. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but everything here is now starting to grow much faster because it's essentially double the amount of light available in my garden. Now this bed over here is where the great bean trial was, which was a total flop, but it is now growing wonderful garlic. These are entirely soft neck varieties. So I now have three garlic beds this year. I'm hoping that between those three, I'll actually have enough to eat. Last year we got 200 heads and it just simply wasn't enough for me. So I think this year I'm probably gonna be closer to 300 and I'm very excited for it. Now over here in the previous video that was just up, it was me removing this asparagus patch entirely. It might be a scary process, but this is essentially what it looks like now. It's just a brown pile of compost, but come spring, this will be loaded with spears because I had so much of that wonderful green growth. Now in the forefront, I had some cabbages, but this is actually an interesting point. Let me just go ahead and pull one out. These were entirely shaded out by that asparagus. And what you could see is that instead of growing short and stocky like a cabbage should, it grew very elongate and it's not really gonna produce a good head. Usually you would want it to be leafing out lower down here, but that lack of light made it stretch out and it's now basically no good. So I'm probably gonna reset this bed entirely and just pull these cabbages out. But I'm just really excited to have way more light in the garden just from removing that asparagus patch alone and the tree all together, it's really looking like a much brighter garden. The lima beans are totally prolific and filling out. So I'll have another lima bean harvest even in December, but that's really all there is to touch on here. We talked about the eggplant a little bit before. So let's go take a look at the side container garden where I have a lot more perennial fruit trees, things like that, and some future plants for a section you haven't seen before. 
As I mentioned, I have a second container garden here. This is mostly focused on things that are perennial or fruit trees. So you see some lemongrass as I work my way down. I have a micro lime that actually produces little tiny limes and uh, Hawaiian guava, some blueberries, my wonderful Greek basil, which is now, I believe, three years old and still going strong. It's a wonderful plant because it produces basil all year round. It smells really fragrant and it doesn't really flower. So the flavor stays consistent throughout the year. Now down here, I have my lime tree, which is my bear's lime. It's actually now starting to over ripen a little bit, which is totally fine. If you let a lime fully ripen, it does turn yellow. It just gets a little sweeter, which I'm totally fine with. It has a ton of flavor. Highly recommend the bear's lime, especially in containers. They seem to do quite well. As I work my way down, You'll see I have a variety of different perennial plants, such as an olive tree, my abutilons, some pineapple guava, lemonade guava, and my personal favorite is the strawberry guava. This is a fruit tree that I'm so impressed by because it's produced two entire flushes of fruit, and this is already the second flush, and I don't know if you could tell, but it's got at least, at least 50 different fruits on there. There are these nice little pocket-sized berries that are absolutely wonderful and full of flavor. Actually, probably my favorite fruit this year. I was very impressed by them and they're extremely prolific. One thing I'll mention is if you live in a tropical climate, such as Hawaii or Southern Florida, that can be invasive. So just keep that in mind. But somewhere like San Diego, you're totally fine growing the or strawberry guava. With no real risk of invasiveness. Now over here is where my giant jacaranda tree used to be. It is a sad sight to see it go. I was very emotional on the day that it was removed but it was just such a hazard to the house. It was basically entirely full of termites. And when they chopped it down, they showed me pieces. Every single part of the trunk was entirely tunneled out with termites. So it was a hazard to the house, hazard to the people walking around it. It was just not a good place to put a tree right up against the house. I didn't put it there, but sometimes you are dealt the cards that you're given and that's just what you have to do. But the cool thing about it is that it's given me an opportunity to create an entirely new landscape and this one's going to be entirely native plant focused. So I've got a manzanita here, specifically the Austin Griffiths variety and a wonderful collection of different native Californian plants. So this is going to be becoming a entirely native garden which will be in, a pre in an upcoming video I should say and I'm really looking forward to it because it's going to be totally hands off just like my pollinator patches, not going to be messed with, it's going to be a habitat for native birds native bugs, insects, and it's just going to be a wonderful, nice place where it's really gonna be low maintenance because native plants don't require that much water. They have different light requirements. I'll talk all about why I selected these and how we'll plant them out in a future video. But that's it for this tour, guys. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.